Hello, everybody, and welcome to the 87th edition of the Frank and Stan chat. And we, as you can see, if you're watching the video, um, we have a guest. Max Pescatori is back for a, a revisit. Hello, Max. Hello, everybody. Hi, Frank. Hi, Stan. Yeah, lovely to have you back. Uh, yeah. uh, Stan, how are you this morning? Um, a bit flat, I think. I've described it this morning. And I, I just, I don't know whether I'm exhausted through watching the news and waiting for something that's never going to happen <laughs> or uh, the fact that I've, I've met with a couple of schools and seen uh, teachers who are faltering on, on the resilience, I would say, not through their own fault, but th they're just tired. Yeah. Uh, I had a lovely quote from a member of staff, which was January has been a really long term. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I just think that, that, that sums it up for uh, for the way some heads and some school leaders are, are feeling at the moment. Yeah, I, I agree. I spoke to a lot uh, of, I've spoken to many head teachers this week. It just happens to be that week, hundreds, and CEOs of multi academy trusts. And uh, I think previously they would have described it as fragile. Now I think they're just just hanging on um and uh, we're two weeks away from the half term um and it was still i'm not we're not wishing to push this again but one of the school heads had an ofsted this week i think you know of a school head who had an ofsted this week they have got the highest levels of absence teacher absence and mm -hmm. uh, pupil absence since the beginning of the pandemic and ofsted now next week are back on it full time you know, yeah. um, it's crazy. And I, if anybody, any head teachers out there, take it from me, it put in for a deferral, <laughs> because actually, if even if that's rejected, you know, it it is a, it is a, a stance you can take if the inspection report doesn't come out the way that you think it ought to come out. You know, um, bringing it on, which is an approach that some heads have taken. Oh, we've been waiting five or six years for this. We think that you know this is not the time to be either you or your staff going through a full in or even just a section eight inspection this is not the time so take it from an, an old experienced inspector like me don't do it you know just yeah. just defer try and get the deferral um, even the uh, i think church of england is restarting the siams inspections from next week are they well i i, I think they're missing that their, their school barometers are not working properly at the moment so anyway max can you just explain to everybody who you are? And yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Frank. thanks, Frank. Yeah, I'm the um, CEO of a Montessori Centre International, which is part of the Montessori Group. And as the name suggests, uh, we teach people to become Montessori educators, um, particularly in the early years in the UK, but um, beyond that, outside of the UK also. So an international organisation that's been around for over 65 years now originally set up by two ladies who were trained by dr maria montessori herself so. ah. now, and actually um there's uh, my son lives in north manchester and there's a montessori uh, nursery i think it is up there but actually uh i think there's a little bit of a mystique around montessori um mm. so i wonder if you could just sort of just explain what when when people use the term montessori what does that actually mean for you Yes. So this this is this is an interesting one, isn't it? Because uh, it means something different to almost everybody anywhere in the world. It's just one of those names, one of those words. Um, but the Montessori is a philosophy, a pedagogy, a way of practice, practicing teaching, very child centered, follow the children through the child's journey on an individual basis. Um, and it's really a method to follow the teacher in their journey of, of practice, who then, you know, does the same for the child. So that's it in simple terms. It's, a, it's an articulation of a quality education um, approach. Um, and actually, one of the things we're finding and one of the conversations we're having day in and day out now is the number of educators who don't have Montessori on their door that essentially practice it you know and it's back to actually it's just a, a way of describing quality educational practice um, not a not a not a curriculum or any, any particular 
uh, you know sort of uh, mode of application so how 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 does montessori view then you know is, is it possible then that, that that it could morph into something which isn't quite sufficiently true to the original philosophy or are is is the organization or the the group the the uh, the movement sufficiently sort of mature to just enable it to develop you know where, where you know because in a way if you just let it develop there's no reason to have much central control is there or any central yeah. organization one of the other challenges we have is that um you can put montessori on your door without practicing montessori so that that's that's something we're sort of having to deal with and and it sort of answers your question at the same time which is that we have a, a quality assurance framework which articulates that quality educational practice and enables practitioners and and those around them to um raise their own self-awareness you know sort of challenge themselves about how they do their practice to continue to be relevant to the child and, and react to situations and be adaptive so what we're asking and offering to the community the educational community everywhere is you know sign up to the accreditation scheme that's not a tick box exercise it's this process where you enter into a contract with yourself to be a co continuously innovative practitioner um and make a declaration about that and, and that will enable you know and if you happen to have the logo on your door that says you're accredited and enables a, a parent to go okay i think i know what goes on and then right. you know yeah, that yeah, establishment yeah. so that's i think that's the way to sort of maybe tackle that brilliant okay i was actually what i was doing there max i was listening but i was also just jotting down when did the record when when did we start doing this recording so that i know when we get to about 30 or 40 minutes um okay stan what's caught your eye this week well, I think I've been overwhelmed with stuff this week. Uh, it's just been a, a complete mixture, which is probably why I'm feeling a bit flat, because a lot of it is um, meeting with people who are still ambitious, um, but feeling as though they're being dragged back. Um, for example, I work with a group of, of uh, Bradford head teachers who are really, really committed and, and ambitious for the, for the children of Bradford, for the, for the schools in Bradford. But rather like yourself with, with Blackpool, the, the perception of Bradford outside of Bradford is very different from how they see it. And they feel as though that perception is dragging them back and they don't know what they can do to change that. Mm. I mean, it won't have helped that they've just had children's services removed, will it? So, yeah. Uh, and, and that's, I mean, one of the things that one of them said that just made me think was, well, people, you know, when we say Bradford, what do you think? And then when we say Haworth, what do you think? Mm. And Haworth's in Bradford. So, so you know, th those two are disconnected, aren't they, in people's, in people's minds? Yes. Uh, and I just thought it, th those kind of things don't get to you until you're at the point of feeling the, there is no praise and at the point where I want to be able to say look we've achieved this hey you're finding that there are other, other barriers that you didn't necessarily see before but be, I think because you're tired because you've hit so many barriers you, you just see all all the things that are in front of you have, have become negative rather than, than positive yeah. and as I say these were really ambitious heads with a really ambitious plan um, and I, I just I worry for the resilience of school leaders at the moment i, I do think it's uh, it, it's faltering in some i cases. think one of the concerns for me is the the half term is a week you know i don't think uh, and, uh, it, and that's no it's not long enough to sort of recharge the batteries and no. i'm actually in a way they're dealing with sort of such high levels of uh, infection in primary schools at the moment that actually, you know, it's it's not really a it's not going to be a, a break either, you know, yeah. in terms of the infection. So, I mean, I really hope that the infection rate falls. But, you know, I, I was speaking to a head um, today in Blackpool had an Ofsted this week. He had thirteen staff off. You know, <clears throat> I mean, I, I think they got through it okay. But it shouldn't be like this. There's enough stress and strain already in the system, yeah. without adding additional burdens on them. Um, yeah. Well, one head was saying, you know. I've got most most of my teaching staff are in now. They've either been through it or they've had their absence, but we, we seem to be there. But welfare staff are off. So I've got my senior managers serving lunches and doing playground duties and the like, which is taking them away from 
the serious job they should be doing yes in those times and it, it's i think it's been all hands to the pub now for for the best part of two years i know and, and you can't continue well, the, the, the head teacher said schools it's got worse isn't it i mean yeah. this period now is probably in terms of absence uh, and illness, they, they, probably at its height that's what? certainly for primary the primary sector this is yeah, and yet at the same time, th th there's a concept that the pandemic's over now, we're back yeah, to normal. I know, I know. And what, are, what are your experiences in terms of parents' um, experience, you know, their reactions, their experiences, because their mm -hmm. kids are going to school and, and uh, or, or, or not, or if they were, you know, I don't know if they're on screen and digitally or otherwise, I'm not sure, but, you know, what's happening there? I mean, I, I think there's, the, I, I from what I can gather, um, yeah. I have to say I didn't speak directly about parents' views with the heads that, and the mm. CEOs I spoke to this week. Mm. But my own children are in, what, three, four primary schools as teachers or leaders. And I think there's, you know, anxiety, but they this sense that, well, we've got to shift them on. You know, they've got to yeah. get back to school. And in a way, what that does is that just brings the, the issue back into the school where they're trying, they, they understand mm. that this has been a very long period of time of disruption. And they do understand that probably the most vulnerable need this the most, you know, the support and care that they get. But actually, they're, they're, but I think they're, I mean, I, I have a personal concern about vulnerable teachers, you know, clinically vulnerable teachers. Um, and I'm pleased, actually, I won't say the name of the school, but there was a, an I've had this thing about air purification. I, you know, Germany, other European countries have heavily gone down the road of air purification. Um, we are, you know, we've sent what I think is eight thousand uh, air purification machines out. You know, my daughter who teaches in year two, she does now have an air purification um, system, which the school bought through Amazon, and it was delivered in a few days, and it didn't cost yeah. an arm and a leg. You know, so in a way. I think she has the monitor and she has that air purification and she has the doors open and the windows open. There's not much more I think anybody could do, but she's in that fortunate position. The vast majority of teachers are not in that position, you know? Mm -hmm. So uh, I think start, uh, parents think, oh, well, we'll you know, we've got to move on. There's pressure at work. I can't cope with all of this. The children are out there and, uh, you know, it's, yeah, it's, I think the head I spoke to said that, that he was feeling appreciation from from parents that they recognised that the school was going beyond, but they're grateful that their, their children are in school because they need them in school to be able to do their jobs. So we we had a um, it's it's quite interesting that isn't it you know you you just put yourself in a um, unusual situation and and interesting things happen. We had a very similar. Um, sort of feedback that's just continued uh, starting early on in the pandemic when uh, parents were I guess more closely interacting with their area years practitioner you know their key work for their child mm -hmm. and and suddenly they started to really see what happens in that classroom and parents were just saying well you know you are so key to what you know to our child's education we didn't realize this went on you know and the, and all of a sudden there's a there's a sort of meeting of minds a real understanding of the value that 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 practitioners and educators bring you know at whatever stage of their child's development yeah I, there's been a lot of uh, massive increase in uh, elective home education mm -hmm. during the pan pandemic and yeah. the councils that i have uh, a relationship with are increasing the number of staff that actually monitor or visit that 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 provision mm. um, but i think it'd be it's you know it's really interesting i think it's probably links to montessori in some respect that mm. you know parents have had a taste of what this education could be if it was personalized to the individual and they mm. can see a disconnect between that approach and one where the, their child you know even in the best provision of 30 children in a classroom you know feel as though it isn't personalized enough for them you know so this idea that i think elective home education was really the 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 lazy the people who were trying to avoid it you know they wanted support in the house that is certainly not the case you know in yeah. one of the most deprived communities in the country this is parents who who actually think what well, rightly or wrongly that they can provide what their child needs and it's this pressure about getting them back. You know, the government's message is, well, we need these children back in classroom. 
but actually parents are choosing now and it's quite hard to change them once they've had the chance to do it and they, and if they are doing it well good for yeah. them but actually you know the, the pressure then for on on them from government from council is get them back in you know which mm. may be mm. counter to what they want to do um yeah. Yeah. So anyway, Max, what's caught your eye this week? Well, um, slightly more sort of optimistically, something that I'll label the leaping frogs. Um, <laughs> um, um, uh, there's a university in Massachusetts that um, are working with frog amputees. So this is frogs that lost one of their limbs. And they have found a way to enable the frogs to regrow their legs, tissue, and everything else, muscles, you know, regrow their leg, essentially, um, which is absolutely amazing, and to do it biologically. So they've gone through this thought process that says, you know, we, how can this happen? There are millions of pathways. There are, you know, thousands of chemicals involved in growing bone and tissue and 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 bits of organ. And they've come down to, they honed it down to a small set of chemicals that they then somehow apply to the frog. And they've got this thing called a bioreactor dome, which looks like a small Pyrex dish, transparent glass dish. They say stick over the limb, which is bonkers idea, stick over the limb for 24 hours. Oh, is it only um, that long? Just 24 hours. It's, I mean, it's, it's, oh, it's I thought bonkers. you were talking about... Yeah, frog having it there for months, you know. No, tw 24 hours, and I guess that gets the chemicals going, triggers that sort of re reaction to start, and they just leave the drug the frogs to it. And what they found was that um, at first they thought nothing was happening, and then over a sort of three or four months, things started to happen. And 18 months later, these frogs had had grown back their legs, um, and they might be a bit malformed. They they were a bit skinny, but you know they're able wow. to go and swim so absolutely amazing that there's this you know biological breakthrough you know a counter to the bionic man where we've gone down the prosthetics and and now do we get the brain and the nervous system to actually make something that's not organic you know work with an organic body uh, to have an alternative to that is amazing and um you know what they want to do with it eventually is to say well can this happen for humans can yeah do? But, so... but i think it's also the creativity of thinking isn't it mm. uh, yeah um it's sort of uh, i think we were saying before that it was sort of flipped it on its head in some respect you know that the 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 sort of this feels like science fiction uh, but but it's yeah. real, you know. It's happening it is now. Real. <laughs> yeah, and I guess they must have said something. I don't know. Salamanders, and I mean, there is one animal, isn't it? But there are a number of animals that can lose their limbs and grow back. So I guess that was a sort of the observation. Yes. And then you, you're right. It's the creativity, the imagination. And well, how does that work? And can we can we make that happen somewhere else? Yeah. You know? Can we do it somewhere else? So yeah, I, I was absolutely fascinating. Really fascinating. Yeah. Well, I, what's caught my eye this week is the Times Education Commission uh, published their interim um, report. Um, it, doesn't, it doesn't contain the recommendations yet, but it's pretty clear where they're going with it. And I was really pleased, talking to Bradford, uh, Stan, uh, I went out to Bradford in the summer and we uh, spoke to uh, a number of local people involved in education, in, including business, with the Times Education Commission. And, uh, and, I'm, and I'm, I also hosted an event in Blackpool uh, at the end of August. And, and it's great because I can see um, clearly um, you know, some of the recommendations, some of the ideas that we were presenting then have found their way into the Commission's report, uh, in, including sort of quotes and stuff that were said at the various meetings. And, and one of the things that has uh, struck me is um, because it links into some work I'm doing with the border regions is just the importance of digital technology and and and, and ensuring that every child has access to a, a, a mobile digital device and also connectivity and 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 we Stan and I have been doing these for 87 editions you know relying on on really good technology it's in touch wood it's not let us down once in those 87 recordings we've never had to re-record it but we've we we invest we're able to invest in in decent uh, broadband connection a decent computer to to run this on um, we can pay for the zoom 
um, uh, subscription. We can do this. But actually, it made me think this week about, well, what if it all stopped? You know, to, I, I was not able for the next six months to have this, this opportunity to use digital devices in this way. You know, I, I think it would be, I'd view it as sort of like not having water, not quite as bad, but certainly not, you know, having electricity, shall we say. You know, it, it feels like it's become such an important part of our lives that I feel I, I'm committed to try and ensure that every child, regardless of their income, you know, parents' income or their carer's income, have at least a viable mobile device to, to, to learn on and a connectivity that allows them to do that. Um, because that for me feels the future. And the, digital, the Times Education Commission was absolutely clear that the expectation of employers and of future adults is that they will be proficient in the use of digital technology. And, it, and, and our schools aren't really doing that. Then, then, you know, I think I said before that a GCSE computing, you, you're not allowed to take a computer into the exam room. You know, I mean, it, it's a bit like saying, well, we're going to do a, a, a technology thing, perhaps with wood, but you can't take a saw with you. You know, that, that's you can draw a saw, you can draw the wood, <laughs> you know, and you might get tested on how good your drawings are. But no, I mean, and it gets to the heart of what a good education is, you know, for me and what it involves. And we've spoken many times about that. So that's what's caught my eye this week. I think, you know, as we've said before, if if you're not going to put the emphasis in terms of what in primary school, certainly what Ofsted are looking for, then you don't have the drive behind it to say, yeah. let's let's do that. Or not the drive. I would say the drive's probably there, but the risk of putting all your eggs in, in one basket and not doing quite as much English and maths in order to do digital technology would feel like a big risk if if the school's in a period where they're going to be inspected, for example. Yeah, it's... It, going to remove I, I, some of those barriers mm, and risks. It'd be interesting to see how employers start to articulate the deficiency because obviously kids are leaving school without the capability stepping into work and then there you know there there pops up the gap yes. um and employers presumably right now we're trying to step in to do some training to do some catch-up training i don't that know is but, absolutely you know, what they said to us this week max yeah it was That's it exactly right, what they, they said yeah. They, yeah. they said you know it's it's and in a way if ever we wanted to level up anything, you know, that, that does mean that you've got to make sure that the young people have the opportunities. It's a pencil, it's paper, you know, and in some families, it, it, there is an assumption among some that actually these are readily available in most families. You know, pencils and paper is, a, is not available in every house, mm. in every family for young people to learn with, you know, even at the point a digital device you know so there is a there is the, all of this needs to roll back to to what is what's required in order to enable young people to to achieve and uh, i mean i i i despair at, at, at some people who are in a position of authority who seem to think that all it's all all you've got to do is just get the children in make sure they're well behaved and they'll learn you know i'm, I'm really sorry but it's much more complicated than that and and mm. I think the thing that saddened me a little bit is that we have had some senior education leaders who have pushed that approach to an extent where the country feels as though the schools can sort it just get get a good head get some good teachers and everything sorted and and really it isn't it's it's you know it, it that takes you a little way in some places it takes you a long way but to think that you can get that across the country is, is, is crazy, you know, and, and it shows a lack of awareness. And we've got some senior people speaking on behalf of a professional, on behalf of the government, who, who actually think that, you know, and that's, that's a worry for me. So, mm. yeah, anyway, Digital Education, Times Education Commission, they went out to Estonia. They have, a, a, a de there's, there's, they've had the debate about what a good education looks like in Estonia. You know, so every there is not now this sort of political knocking about of education. There is a you know, 10, 20 year plan for education and we're going for it. And, and they have something called e-Estonia, where every child has their digital device. You know, it's just forward thinking. It's not based on Victorian standards. It's not based on just good behaviour. 
you know this is about a coming together of what the country needs in order to be yeah. successful yeah and i think some of that imagination stuff you know al allowing all our children whatever stage of development they're at to imagine to be creative to interact with others to you know get that social emotional side um, you know raise the importance of that but make it and just embedded it into the behaviors of them what they do and everybody around of them is also key to enable enable those things to happen you know so it's it's not about ticking box and passing exams it's a much broader and richer yeah. you know ecosystem that we need, as a community need to sort of try and get ahead around i think i must get my head around yeah. that eco i love that term that ecosystem i i don't use that phrase enough but it as soon as you yeah. said it i thought yeah that's what i that's yeah. what i'm trying to describe it so yeah. how, how things changed two years ago was it when we had the general last general election and the prospect of, of broadband free broadband for the country was laughed yeah. laughed out of uh, you know it wasn't something that was either necessary no. or possible and yet what we see with the pandemic is it's absolutely vital yeah if absolutely i'm going to level up then you know i think free access to broadband and a device that will work on it is is a minimum standard i know yeah i agree and i mean this week there's been some debate in parliament isn't there about ey funding that the house frank yeah so steve um steve bryan mp who is chair of the ppg for early child care and education um, managed to secure a, a slot and it just happened to coincide with the um this week's early childhood and education week so it was a week where we celebrate early years educators yeah. Beaut beautiful coincidence <laughs> I'll, I'll i'll take that <laughs> Um, but uh, yes, uh, the debate was around the role of educators, early years educators in our community. And I have to say, I mean, you can go back and watch it's record, all these are recorded. I have to say it was rich with um, comment from a whole host of MPs from different colours, you know, different flags, who had taken the time to step into their communities, go and visit nurseries in, in, their, in their constituencies and talk to practitioners and talk to parents. And we're coming back with the same messages, which is, you know, it's a vital provision it's very necessary for kids practitioners um our teachers they are educators we need to value them as such and and in valuing the search we need to look at you know the professionalization of them or recognition that they're professionals um you know pay them a wage that's um you know uh, that's representative of the value they bring you know qu quite a lot of our practitioners um, learn earn seven eight pounds an hour yeah, you yeah. know and have to supplement their, their work by going to work somewhere else you know take on the job of the supermarket or something to, to sort of make ends meet so it was um you know a very powerful session with very clear statements and, and comments um so i was very pleased to hear that and and, and um I say it coincided beautifully with this week's celebration of early years educators. Yeah, it's a, I mean, one of the issues um, is around the qualification, isn't it? It's around something around how because I, I, I have um, I take a, my uh, one of the grandchildren to a nursery uh, where we live on a Monday. It's a pleasure because she they have a, um, a, a the leader is a teacher a qualified teacher she's amazing I, I, I call her out here Rachel Rachel is making a difference to India's life because India is looking now at Rachel and I and when she comes home I'm she's Rachel you know she wants to be Rachel wow. and the experiences yeah. that they have um, whereby I remember once it was absolutely it was not hailing but it was thinking oh, i'm not going out because it looks a bit cold and it, it, it could be snow but a, a photo came on that they they'd marched more down to the local library for the library session and and indy's three she's a young three-year-old and, and actually I, i'm really struck by the quality of the consideration of what the activities are and how meaningful they are but also how how wonderfully marvelous rachel is as a human being and, and her as a teacher, because she's the only teacher in the setting, but how her modelling of her behaviour spills out onto the people that work for her who are not qualified teachers, who some of whom are, are qualified, but 
but actually it's as if Rachel is the, the role model. You know, this is the, like, she is the head teacher for the nursery, you know, so everything she's doing, the way she's reacting, the way she's responding is, is, is not just impacting on India, our, our grandchild, but also very strongly on the staff as well, yeah. you know, so I suppose in a sense, this is your area of work, isn't it? That's what you're trying to achieve. Exactly. I mean, she sounds like a perfect example of, of, of an educator that is reflexive. You know, she, she considers each child to be unique and looks at, you know, what that child needs. But it's it's a challenge to the practitioner to, to be on top of their game, you know, in the sense of, um, you know, always being innovative, trying to make sure that each time they've got the best um, ecosystem but using that word again <laughs> for that child um, and that's key to good practice it, it's so fundamental because you as you say you know your granddaughter spends an awful lot of time with that you know with Rachel and um, the, the relationship that your, your granddaughter has with Rachel is second only to the relationship she has with her parents and family mm. and it's a very important triumvirate um, to do that and and I think if you get a good practitioner like that that can um, develop their staff the uh, other educators that's fabulous and again we, we're calling out for the ability to to support that you know it's continuing professional development so whatever level and stage of the profession you're at has to be fundamental to key to the job you do and at the moment there just isn't the funding available to do that you know it's just um, it's very difficult to make, make ends meet particularly in some of these smaller um settings and nurseries yeah it's interesting for me go on Stan you're going to say I was going to say we in my uh, company we have a, an earlier specialist and she is just now um starting some some reflective research with some nursery heads but prompted by the fact that they're very lonely because these mm. nurseries are spread out that they don't have access so in the last two years to meetings with colleagues to yeah. uh, um, so we're, we're trying to do something that's a research-based that's something that's, that's of interest to them and they work together and we've had a great response from yeah. people who, who want to get involved with that it's a fantastic initiative stan oh, it's really commendable that that's going ahead um because day in day out it's you know it's you it's you you and the kids you know yeah. the and and it's you know these jobs it's a professional that's a vacation teaching's a vacation isn't it and mm -hmm. and, and so when you're compelled to to when you step into that space you want to be the best teacher and educator you can be um but you know you're not an island you know no. we all no. you know we all need to talk to, to people and bounce ideas and and, and share experiences and particularly the, the best thing is. though the best cpd well, perhaps i should make name drop uh, liz in that dr dr elizabeth clavins is leading that maybe i should drop a name in yeah. She's been great. <laughs> yeah yeah and I, I, the one thing i would say also is that if you're fortunate to have a, a really excellent leader or teacher or whatever, you know, that is daily CPD, isn't it? It's daily. It's not, oh, well, we're going here. We're going to learn about this. This is about, you know, how everything, the ecosystem, how it all fits together in that yeah. setting. You know, yeah. and realize we're not going to be able to stop Frank saying ecosystem from now. On. <laughs> I love that word. I love it. <laughs> it's my word of the week. <laughs> I'll be going to say to my wife, you know, well, I'm about the family, you know, I wonder how they <laughs> ecosystems working. <laughs> what do you, mean? Don't you mean family? Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, well, actually, believe it or not, folks, that's 35 minutes. <laughs> Wow. I know, I know. It's it always a, always flies by. It was it's such a delight. Yeah, well, well I've not had a chance to mention this tone. Yet. Have you got your copy? <laughs> have you read that? Yeah, what have you not read it, Stan? What have you been doing? <laughs> Thankfully, it's exactly my kind of book because the instructions say to dip into it, not, not to read it. <laughs> <laughs> so that's my kind of book. <laughs> Actually, I'd be interested to know. I mean, I, I haven't uh, got mine yet. Uh, I have ordered it, but it hasn't arrived. Um, but actually, it'd be interesting, you know, to pick out something each week, you know, to pick that out and see. So if 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 you haven't got the book, if you're watching or listening to this and you'd like us to do that, just drop us an email and uh, we'll pick out some little gems for a discussion point uh, each week. But talking of each week, let, next week we have uh, Liz Robinson from Big Education, who was a very, very well received guest like you, Max, last time. And so she's coming on next week. So uh, looking forward to having 
uh, another chat with Liz, and no doubt she she will have read the book, Stan. I'm pretty certain she will that. have read the book. Well, she's not following the instructions if she's read the book. <laughs> I am beginning to follow the instructions, and it does definitely say dip in and out. I'm interested in where you dip in first. Dip in, where, where, which way uh, did you go first? Well, following the instructions, you, you're told to read the first chapter first, and that, that then sets the tone. But, right. but I, I was because of what's going on in education to be fair i wasn't dipping into the the history of um ministers and what their impact have been and what they believe their impact right. oh yeah yeah because they've interviewed each of them haven't they yeah yeah yeah, yeah. and you forget them you, yeah. you see well, yeah like, somebody said to me <laughs> i don't even remember that name but you no, know somebody said who was who was the secretary of state um i was i was on a uh, a radio thing this week and somebody, somebody was referring to the, the uh, previous Secretary of State, you know, Gavin Williamson, and I'm thinking, God, I can't even remember whose name is. You know, I, I can't <laughs> contribute because I can't remember his name. <laughs> please don't ask me. Please don't ask me. But it came to me eventually. But, you know, I mean, that was yeah. only months ago, wasn't it? But anyway. Um, OK, well, thank you for joining us, Max. Thank you, Stan, again. And uh, we'll be back all being well next week with another Frank and Stan. Uh, oh, before we go... We have to say, when we started doing this, we never thought that Professor Dame Alison Peacock would yeah. call us Morecambe and Wise, <laughs> but she did last week. <laughs> it's like being on the Morecambe and Wise show. <laughs> we then thought, is that good or bad? But anyway, we'll take it as That's good. good. Sure That's good. That's good. That's good. Yeah. Anyway. We're anyway. going to take it as good. Yeah. Okay, we'll see you all next week. Take care. Bye. Bye for now. Bye. Bye. Bye.